All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second last talk. Uh, before we start, may maybe we can agree on a um, on a change of rules. Can you ask questions during the talk and not after the talk? May, may, may make more sense, perhaps. Uh, yeah, fine. I mean, so I noticed uh, most people here uh, start or end uh, their talks um, uh, recounting cheerful anecdotes uh, relating to Boris. Um, that puts me in a somewhat tight spot uh, because the only um, halfway entertaining anecdote I, I could possibly tell had a deep and, in fact, um, somewhat traumatic uh, influence on my life. But he's not yet here, so I can tell you. Uh, it's about how I ended up in Boris's car uh, on two separate uh, occasions. <laughs> Uh, you remember. And um, uh, I don't know how many of you uh, share with me that experience, uh, but with me, um, it had been enough uh, to lose all faith in that means of transportation. And ever since, uh, I have to rely on uh, two-wheeled uh, vehicles uh, as an uh, alternative. And uh, you can imagine um, what that means in a German uh, winter. So that's a uh, somewhat sad story. Uh, there is one more uh, personal account I would like uh, to share with you. Uh, before I start uh, going, it goes back a uh, thousand years um, when I was a young, just beginning uh, research student at our institute doing my first own research. And uh, from one day to the next, um, the Russians came to our um, institute that before had been rather quiet. Um, so not, not just Boris, but also um, Igor Lerner and Volodya Kravtsov, Volodya Yutson, uh, several others more. And I vividly remember how, how that introduced me to a style of doing physics, which I hadn't known uh, so far. I mean, a style distinguished for vibrancy, for energy, spirit, a uh, degree of healthy roughness at times. Um, I mean, all things which were very influential. And I also understood that I could never possibly be up to it. I mean, not being breastfed in the Soviet Union, don't have the proper education. But, but still, it was enough to have a strong influence, and I'm profoundly grateful for that. I mean, yeah. Um, I hope some of that uh, reflects in the subject of the of the talk I want to give. It's about um, biometals, topological metals, uh, in connection uh, with disorder, a subject many of you here in the room um, have, in fact, defined and uh, shaped. And uh, I understand you had an entire session on biometals. So the, the way I want to um, organize this, I start with the a uh, concise yet hopefully self-contained introduction to the clean wild metal, uh, essentially uh, retelling things you maybe already know. And then we turn to the uh, disordered case, and I motivate the story I want to tell you. So um, the wild metal, I mean, uh, we are dealing with three-dimensional um, fermions. Uh, and in the Brion zone, um, we have a situation where there are uh, two Dirac cones sit, two linearly dispersing uh, Dirac cones. Um, these cones can be manipulated. They can be split relative to each other in momentum space um, on account, I mean, on the expense of breaking certain symmetries by some momentum vectors. They can also be shifted um, in, in energy at the expense of breaking other symmetries such that we create uh, topological Fermi surfaces, as shown here. But they cannot be individually destroyed because they carry topological um, charge. So let's wrap up what we can say in, in, in general terms um, uh, about this type of systems. I already mentioned the, the nodes are protected against uh, being kept out. They can be moved, uh, and in this way we can create uh, family surfaces. Um, these systems can be physically conceptualized in different ways. And one way I want to bring up briefly, uh, we can think of them as theorists um, in terms of stacked topological uh, insulators. I mean, you, you will not, if you don't know this picture, you will not be able to understand it on the spot. It's just meant to alert you to one thing. Uh, this two-dimensional layered way of, of, of uh, thinking about the system, in terms of topological insulators, tells us that they share <coughs> properties with uh, layered quantum hole systems. So each topological insulator is similar to a quantum hole, two-dimensional quantum hole. Um, in the later, and if you stack them up, um, you generate a layered structure which, in fact, has a Dirac nodes in the dispersion and is a wild metal. Um, they are also real. I mean, I am, of course, you have to couple these guys uh, to achieve this. They, they are real. I mean, um, in reality, um, have been realized in different ways, um, and um, there's more materials coming. Um, the quantum hole analogy also tells us uh, that something is going on at the surface. I mean, quantum hole physics, right? There's surface physics going on. The key word in this connection is Fermi arcs. And um, the most important uh, physical mechanism at work in the system is 
the non-conservation of charged individu individual nodes, which is known as the axial anomaly. Now, being condensed metaphysicists, uh, we can think about it as follows. If we perturb the system by application of an electric and or magnetic field, we induce spectral flow from one node to the other via high-lying portions of the band, which are not shown in this picture. There is an equivalent way, uh, equivalent, another way of thinking about it, the more particle physics-like way, where we understand the same phenomenon as um, the non-conservation of charge, I mean, axial anomaly known from uh, relativistic uh, fermions, Dirac fermions. Now, this phenomenon, uh, in turn, that generates phenomenological effects, consequences, and in the first place, several types of transport coefficients, transverse uh, transport coefficients, and the two famous ones, or most famous one, most distinguished one, go by the name Carroll magnetic effect and anomalous Hall effect. And I will explain or recapitulate what that is. So the, the short, fast track to understand um, these, these effects, or to at least hint at their existence, is uh, to write down um, an equation which expresses the non-conservation of, um, of currents and densities at individual nodes. So we have an axial current density, the difference in charge and current between the two nodes. And this guy is non-conserved, and the non-conservation is, is expressed by a certain topological creature involving electromagnetic uh, fields. And if you uh, think a little bit about this relation and ask what it means, then you are led to conclude that um, it leads to transport effects. And um, in particular, we have the anomalous Hall effect, which means the following. If the nodes are split in momentum space by a certain fixed offset vector, this B-splitting vector, which I mentioned in the beginning, and you apply an electric field, <coughs> you generate a current transverse to the field. So it's like a Hall effect, and this guy here um, the splitting acts like an intrinsic magnetic field. That's one effect. And um, the other one, which is arguably a little bit more interesting, goes by the name Carroll magnetic effect. And that tells us the following. If the nodes are split in chemical potential, they bias the chemical potentials, and uh, you apply a magnetic field, you will observe a current flow parallel to the magnetic field. And these two are more or less immediate consequences of this relation there of topological origin. Okay, so that wraps up in a nutshell uh, what I wanted to say about the, the, the clean vial. And um, what I want uh, uh, to do now is I ask the question, what happens if we take the idealist clean system and um, subject it to disorder, which will always be there? And of course, I owe you a motivation why one should care. I mean, why, why this is interesting. Um, the way I want to organize the discussion is I first discuss entirely on qualitative terms uh, what disorder can be expected to do. Um, then, in a very, very brief intermediate term, I, I construct an effective theory which uses field theory. I, I will argue why we need field theory here. And then I want to um, discuss with you the ramifications of disorder in the two transport coefficients which I just mentioned. And I promise there will be one surprise. At least for me, it came as a real qualitative surprise. And uh, that is work with, uh, done jointly with Dima Bagretz. <coughs> So to motivate why we might want to look at uh, disorder, uh, let me briefly uh, uh, review for you um, two strands of previous work, which appeared recently. Um, and um, they are hooked to two questions you can ask. The first question, and it was asked by um, Spivak and Zon and independently by Burkhoff, is the following. Um, suppose um, we uh, consider the metal um, this, yeah, tuned to a configuration where we have two nicely developed topological Fermi surfaces, and now we put some disorder, and in particular disorder that will scatter from one cone to the other. So that will actually make the two cones talk to each other by scattering. Right? Um, how much of these beautiful topological textures will survive? I mean, will it all get washed out, or what is going to happen? And um, the way they uh, approached this question was, um, because they have a small parameter here, large Fermi surface, small disorder, um, they uh, used uh, kinetic equations and diagrams, respectively, and uh, independently came to the following um, answer. There is a kinetic equation which tells us how density relaxes in the system. I mean, uh, density, and when we talk about density, we have to discriminate the actual total charge density and the axial charge density, which is the difference in charges sitting at the two nodes, right? And both of them satisfy a diffusive kinetic equation, so they diffuse, no surprise. Um, the axial charge density relaxes due to internode scattering. Also no surprise, it gets equilibrated. The interesting thing is that these equations are coupled, and they are coupled by a term of topological origin, which is proportional to an external magnetic field. 
And that, that one here is a remnant. This, this is a remnant of topology in the system. And if you now uh, work a little bit on these equations and solve them under mildly <coughs> idealizing assumptions, you find um, that um, there is the chiral magnetic effect manifests itself in a contribution to the magnetoconductance. And that contribution is quadratic in B, quadratic in B, and proportional um, to the internode scattering time. So if you have strong internode scattering, you, you kill, you kill it. But for any finite amount of internode scattering, it is uh, there. And uh, this has been seen experimentally in a recent experiment by Ong. And they say that the ratio of the elastic scattering time, I mean, um, uh, to the internode scattering time, because the disorder is somehow weak, uh, soft, excuse me, is order 10 to the 2. So we have a small parameter. Yeah? Hmm? Yeah, very good. That's my main point. I come to that. That's the question you want to ask at the end. Yes, it's, so it cannot be correct. Very good, thank you. So it, there is no, it doesn't have a sensible limit. Uh, as be, so we have to understand what happens for infinite tau in the clean limit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they, they, that's a, they, they're really linked topologically, right? And I, I'll explain that later on. It, it follows from, from yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's not my formula. It's their formula. Uh, and and I'm, I'm telling you there is a better formula. So this formula... Uh, yeah, that's a harsh formulation. Uh, yeah, but inspiring. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, um, um, that was the first line of work. Then there is another one, uh, which is actually equally controversial. Um, and that now asks a different question. It, was, it, it, it started endless, uh, I mean, many years ago, and uh, the latest reincarnation is recent work by Sisronov and Gurari. And they ask, how will this order affect these delicate nodes sitting down here? Yeah? And um, they uh, uh, do that as follows. Well, it can be done as follows. Suppose you have some Gaussian distributed disorder in the system. You will generate an impurity scattering vertex. Yeah, on average. Now, if you do dimensional analysis, um, you find on dimensional ground that this is strongly irrelevant in three dimensions. So it, it, it scales to zero. It, it suggests that this order doesn't affect the Dirac node very strongly. Then you think a little more and um, realize that dimensional analysis may not suffice here because we are dealing Dirac fermions in high dimensions and we should expect strong ultraviolet fluctuations. So um, you work a little harder and go beyond this approximation, and in fact beyond the non-crossing approximation, and find uh, ultraviolet divergent contributions uh, to the scattering vertex. And what it amounts to is an additional term in the flow equation of next higher order, similar to Koldo perhaps. And what you, uh, what you are led to uh, conclude is that there is a quantum critical point. So if the disorder is stronger than a certain critical amount, which um, is of the order of the bandwidth, there is no other parameter here at this point, you generate a runaway flow to strong disorder, and for weaker disorder, you flow back to the fixed point, quantum critical point. Uh, the question then is what happens uh, at, I mean, that's the question I want to address in this talk, is what happens here in this strong disorder regime? I mean, what happens if, if naively the disorder scales up to what kind of um, phase you will flow? And um, uh, Gurari uh, and Sysranov came up with all kinds of um, um, uh, Predictions and all of them are controversial, so it's 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 a bit um, tricky uh, ground. Yes. Yeah, so the, the the question I want to address now uh, in the rest of the talk is, what happens if we are yeah? yeah. Is that the bare uh, disorder strength? You say you have some disorder characterized by some variance. Small gamma. Yes, and. Uh, I will. Yeah. Uh, this is just the bare, I mean, um, so it, it tells us that the dis, much like in graphene, or what, the, the bare, on the, bare, at the Dirac cone, the disorder becomes stronger. Then you uh, reach length scales where the scattering, you have multiple scattering and you go diffusive. And that's what I want to turn to that. So what I, what I want to do now is I want to discuss the physics at large distance scales in the supercritical disorder system. Large distance scales means multiple scattering. And what I suspect is, and I will show how it comes, is that this is a 3D Anderson metal. A metal, uh, but th that metal must contain some topological 
signatures built in. I mean, um, these, these topological features uh, survive as, as we learned from the first line of works. And the question is how and, and how the system does all that. And um, to answer all these questions, um, um, I use a, a, a bit of field theoretical machinery. Um, the construction is actually quite technical, but um, I, I don't want to torture you with that. I just want to highlight a few conceptual steps in the construction of an eff effective theory which are conceptually important. Yeah? And, and then we quickly jump to reading out the predictions. So we want to do a theory of um, disorder in non-interacting fermion system. We want to compute green functions to extract transport coefficients. And the way to do it is to start from a replica functional or supersymmetry or Keldish, doesn't matter here. Um, so we have a replica index, say, uh, and, and, and here is a Hamiltonian. And then we need to discriminate between advanced and retarded green functions. So there's a bit of symmetry breaking on that level. One important thing, and that will be very important in the following, is that this action here, it sounds technical, but there is physics sitting there, has a huge inbuilt symmetry. You can rotate these size by rotations in replica space and in advanced retarded space by unitary matrix. And if this is constant, uh, the action stays invariant. So there is a huge symmetry. OK, now we play the standard games going back, I mean, uh, endless times. Um, we average over this order. And then we get an effective phi to the four fermion vertex. We decouple it by Hubbard Srotonovich, and we run a mean field program. That's what everybody does in this business. And um, it was done for us in this context by Fredkin in 86. And what Fredkin found is um, that <coughs> there does exist a finite mean disorder-induced mean field scattering amplitude. This has the significance of a mean field um, of a mean scattering amplitude if and only if your disorder is supercritically strong. Otherwise, you don't get it. So if the disorder is too weak, you don't find a mean field, and there is no field theory to, to talk about. But if you are supercritically strong, you induce this term. It cause, gives us a mean scattering rate physically, and it breaks the symmetry, which I just mentioned. It, it, it breaks it. Um, by that, I mean the fo following. There is not just man, one solution to these mean field equations, but many. They are distinguished by the symmetry, which I just mentioned. And the situation is if you have never seen that before, really analogous to what happens in a magnet. Yeah? So this infinitesimal I delta I started out is like an infinitesimal magnetic field in a magnet. There is a phase transition. We break the symmetry. It's like a mean magnetization. But then we can rotate it homogeneously by um, changes in the magnetization axis. And they generate Goldstone modes. Physically, these will be the diffusion modes in the problem. Now, um, we want to understand the physics of these uh, generated by these soft rotations here. Uh, these are the lowest lying energy uh, degrees of freedom in the problem. And much like in a magnet, we want to um, expand somehow conceptually in, in soft generators of magnon like diffusion excitations. Yeah? And we want to know what is the effective theory of these guys. And they will be the main players in the game now. And one important thing is that we can conceptualize these as in two different ways. Um, we can think of them as Goldstone modes. That's the way how I introduced them. But equivalently, they uh, have a lot in common with gauge fields, like a non-abelian gauge field. And that's important because if we deal with a gauge field in three-dimensional Dirac fermion materials, we expect um, massive manifestations of the anom anomaly. And that was all worked out by the particle physicists in the 80s for us. And the key word is parity anomaly. So we expect the manifestation of the anomaly um, due to uh, work up by Redlich, and I, I'll tell you how it comes and what the phenomenology is. Re regardless of the interpretation, what we want to do now is we want to integrate our fermion and then expand the action in um, somehow in, 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 gra in, in gradients, in ascending order in these guys. And um, I will tell you now uh, how these pieces here look and what, what kind of physics follows from them. OK. So. Um, the, now, now the, the way I want to organize that part of the discussion is I directly link it to the physically observable effect. So the, the first part of the discussion now connects to the anomalous Hall effect to, to recapitulate that's the effect that the system has somehow like an inbuilt magnetic field, the splitting of momentum modes, and has transverse response. And the question is, how do we get that from this type of description? <laughs> so it turns out, if you work uh, seriously hard, that um, the first two terms in the expansion in these A's look like that. I mean, they will not mean anything to you. Don't worry. Just notice they are of first and second order in A, respectively. These are the first two terms. And they look utterly alien in this way. But we can introduce variables which um, are frequently used in this context, the famous Q matrices of Jevetov and Wigner. And if we 
expresses action in that language we obtain this here, and that's known to many of us. Um, that is here the diffusive nonlinear sigma model, um, which in this business contains two terms. One is um, an ordinary diffusion term, that's what it physically describes, and there is a prefactor which is a longitudinal bare conductivity. Um, and then there is a term which looks like a Poiskin term, like a quantum Hall term. This is a term we get in the quantum Hall effect, only that we are in three dimensions. So it looks like a layered stacked up quantum hall action. And that connects now to this um, interpretation I mentioned in the beginning that the system can be understood in terms of layered quantum hall uh, species. And the corresponding uh, uh, physics was uh, discussed by the next speaker, so I don't have to discuss it, uh, long ago. Um, so there is a system uh, known as the um, uh, layered quantum hall effect. And uh, the action above, which we derived, is the effective action of that one. What does it mean physically? Um, it means the following. Um, <clears throat> we have this action with some bare coupling constants, which um, uh, respectively define the um, uh, bare conductivity, um, which, I mean, depends a little bit on where we are or whether we are at the nodes or high away, far away. And then there is a bare whole conductivity, which is essentially set by the splitting vector. And now you want to know what happens, uh, fluctu I mean, how do fluctuations, quantum fluctuations, diffusion mode fluctuations affect this? And that too has been worked out long ago um, in this paper here by two loop renormalization group methods. And the physical conclusion is that the situation is boring. Um, so uh, what happens is that um, the uh, longitudinal conductance in three dimensions scales omic. So we have metallic behavior. We have a good metal, an omic metal. And we have a stable um, whole conductivity. The whole conductivity is also ohmic, and it's not affected in any way by disorder. It's just set by the splitting vector in momentum space. It doesn't renormalize. Unlike in the quantum Hall effect, the whole conductivity does not renormalize. So that's the first conclusion. Yeah. Um, I'm, to, to, to recapitulate, the, the, the bulk, I mean, the, to zeroth order approximation, the physics of the system is a good metal. It supports the whole conductivity or whole conductance which is not affected by this order significantly, and uh, that's pretty much it. Um, now, that here, I mean, this whole conductivity describes the anomalous Hall effect. Now, now, what about the chiral magnetic effect? And that one is more interesting. Question? No? <coughs> yes. Yes. Now I see that. Yeah. No, that yeah, that that is because um, let me go back. Um, oh, I have to go back quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, no, uh, you, you don't see it with your naked eye. I agree. But um, believe me, if you um, if you plug this here, if you plug this in, this representation, you get it. I can I can do the calculation for you in five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Sigma yeah, sigma yeah. uh, alone magnetic field perpendicular, and in this action, they are, uh, there is no sigma yy. Uh, you mean why there is no sigma yy? And, um, no, alone magnetic field perpendicular to magnetic field, you have difference in that field. Oh, but the, the magnetic, um, um, you, you, you should think of this here. Um, Yes, I mean there, there is more, more coefficients, but there is a lot of degeneracy in the con conductivity tensor. So, you, in fact, you have a three-dimensional metal. I mean, one direction is singled out by the magnetic field, and then I have a sort of boring isotropic longitudinal conductivity, this is sigma xx. And um, if I now apply an electric field perpendicular to this guy, then I will get something transverse, and that's the sigma xy as it's written there. Sigma yy is the same as sigma xx. Yeah. 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 That, that, uh, yeah. But but there, there, there comes there there comes something. In, I mean, very good. I mean, there, um, if we go to the current magnetic effect, that that stops. There, there is another. Uh, indeed, very good. I mean, so I can. Uh, how much time do I have? People are asking lots of questions. So. Oh yeah, very good. Um, so now I want to turn to the chiral magnetic effect. And um, just to recap that one, that's an independent transport effect. And it means that, or what it tells us, if we bias the nodes, give them a relative chemical potential, 
apply magnetic field, then we will obtain a current in the direction of the magnetic field. So this, Boris, this will be a sigma ZZ. Yeah? This will be the um, where, where does this information sit uh, on this effect? And the answer is we have to go one order higher in A. And why, why is that no surprise that we have to go one order? This is now, re remember, gauge field in three dimensions. That's what we are dealing with. And what we should expect is a chan simons action. So chan simons is a natural action to expect for a gauge field in three dimensions. And indeed, there is one in the system. So there is a non-abelian chance Simons action which appears at the third order in the expansion. Oh, that was, no, that was no good. Here it is. So, there it is. Um, it looks a bit strange. There are some projectors on retarded advanced space. Forget about them, but it has a typical form. A, D, A, and A cubed. Yeah. And <clears throat> now what is the physics of this one? Um, uh, to build some faith, I mean, into the existence of this, this is not some theory nonsense, uh, we can run a little sanity check. Um, we do the following. Uh, we assume that localization effects don't play a role, and uh, that uh, justifies to take these T's, these rotations, these uh, guys, and to expand them to leading order in magnons, if you want. I mean, quadratic order in, in ge rotation generators. And if we plug that in, we get something which is, for this A, which is still a nonlinear object, which is quadratic in these um, uh, generators of diffusion modes, they have some internal structure. Don't worry about that. They also have a structure in nodal space. We have two nodes. And we plug that into our action in the presence of a magnetic field, an external magnetic field. And we work a little, and we get this kind of effective diffusion propagator. So what you see here is an effective diffusion of the system. And again, it has a structure in node space, which uh, they get coupled by internode scattering. And there is a magnetic field which affects the nodes differently, effectively. There is a diffusion term and a frequency term. I'm showing this because if you now, on that basis, uh, work out the uh, what, what the densities, how they diffuse, you get these um, burkhoff zon spivak uh, equations. So um, it is absolutely essential. Um, I mean, the, the chan simons term, which effectively sits here. You can't see it so quickly. Why? But believe me, it's there. Um, it generates these coupling terms. So that, that term is definitely an essential player in the game. But now it was already pointed out by the audience uh, that the physics that derives from there, the quadratic in B uh, magnetoconductivity, can't be quite right. So the question is, um, how do we fix that? And to this end, um, let me now ask a, a physical question. Suppose we do a theorist cartoon of a quantum transport experiment. I mean, we take a quasi one-dimensional um, uh, vial, um, vial wire. <laughs> Uh, the splitting is in this direction, so this is um, along the axis. We apply magnetic field along the axis, and we apply battery, and we ask what, what will we measure. And um, Burkhoff and Zon will tell us there is a magneto I mean, correction to, magnet uh, to the ohmic conductance, which is B squared. But then it was pointed out that this, I mean, suppose we tense out tau A to infinity, clean limit. It, it doesn't make sense, right? You have a diverging contribution, it can't be right. Then comes another group of people, uh, Parameshwaran and Vishwanath. Um, they tell us something else. They consider the clean limit. So forget about this order for a while. And they argue as follows. Um, if you apply a magnetic field, what happens is, I think Adi mentioned it in his talk, you get a quantum Hall effect at the Dirac nodes. And in particular, there is a zero energy quantum Hall layer bent. And it has, um, it is chiral. And so that, that, that quantum Hall um, state contributes to uh, transport. And um, it gives us a contribution to current flow, which is proportional to an effective number of channels. And that effective number of channels is proportional to the degeneracy of the quantum Hall states. So you would say, ah, there is a ballistic conductance in the absence of disorder. And the ballistic conductance is linear in B. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and now is the question, how do these guys match? In, in, in what, what sense? I mean, somehow they should, right? I mean, if you put this order here, I mean, somehow they should meet. And I, I want to tell you how they, how they match. And um, that's um, uh, what the system has for us in store is, is really a surprise. At least for me, it was surprising I mean, the way how it does it. So let me try to explain that. So the way to uh, describe this in comprehensive terms is, um, yeah, I mean, what we do is we take our friends, the A's, we couple some external magnetic field and maybe some source fields required to compute something and plug this animal here into this complicated Chan Simons action. And then we project onto the quasi one dimensional limit. That's conceptually what we do. And we obtain this action, which at first sight looks complicated, 
But um, you, just by looking at it, you can understand that there is interesting physics. So what this action has, this is now the action of the quasi-one-dimensional wire. It has an ordinary diffusion term here, which we already had. I mean, this is a diffusion term. Diffusion. And then it has a term linear in derivatives. And this prefactor here is independent of this order. So um, what, uh, what is surprising about that is that just on power counting, we know that a term that is linear in derivatives will always win at large distance scales. So we are led to the conclusion that the system diffuses, will diffuse at short scales, and then become ballistic at large scales. Normally, it's the other way around in a metal, right? If you have an ordinary metal, you are ballistic at short scales, then you scatter and go diffusive. But here, it's the other way around. So you first diffuse, and then you cross over into a drift-dominated transport, which is disorder independent. And that, that I mean, to, for me, it took a time to accept that. Um, that, that is, sounds like Halloween physics, um, but um, the, it's all cut off eventually. Um, if you have internode scattering, um, the two fields at the nodes, they lock to each other by this term, and that kills this kind of guy. So um, we are led to the conclusion that there are at least three independent length scales in the problem. And you can adjust them at arbitrary at will. I mean, you can tune them to whatever you want. There is one length scale, I call it LB, which determines the crossover from diffusion at short scales to ballistic drift at longer scales. And this ballistic drift is pushed by the topology. Then eventually, at some point, you, your nodes hybridize and you cross over again into some diffusive regimes. And eventually, at some point, you have Anderson localization in quasi one dimension. So that's um, the, uh, what, what kind of the rough picture is. Um, now, the, you, you can tune these parameters to whatever you want, um, and that's complicated. I mean, three independent scales, and you know, it's too much to keep track of. Let me just show you on a few examples what that means now for transport coefficients. Yeah? And um, so what, what we do is we sit down and work out the conductance. You have to be really careful here with boundary conditions. It's, it's a bit more tricky than usual. And what you then find is an expression for the conductance in terms of two independent parameters. One is system size in terms of this nodal hybridization length, the, the elastic free, free pass due to nodal coupling. And then there is this drift diffusion crossover scale, again, in, in the units of the same length scale. And you get this little monster here. And that, that one here now uh, has uh, <laughs> Burkhoff and Vishwanath as limits. So that, that's the same equation. I mean, it, and, um, uh, so, for example, if you consider this limit, um, length shorter than the, this crossover length, I mean, where you still diffuse, and all that shorter than the nodal scattering, then you get the Burkhoff and Zon approximation. But if you um, plot now just this conductance result um, as a function of an effective magnetic field, so you, you, you crank up the magnetic field, then you find that at short, I mean, for, for, for small fields, where you're effective in, effectively in the diffusion regime, you get the Burkhoff and um, spivak zon uh, quadratic increase. And then for larger fields, you go ballistic and you cross over in this, um, into this uh, Vishwanath regime, which is linear in the field. A, a, a more um, kind of more entertaining way of plotting this is, is this here. This is now the conductance as a function of length in double logarithmic uh, units. And... Um, what we have is that for short lengths, lengths shorter than the drift diffusion crossover, you have a one over L behavior. I mean, it's omic. And then we cross over between, here now, here now drift takes over, it makes the system longer. It effectively goes, becomes clean. They actually, we check that there is no noise here. This is a noiseless, I mean, the system doesn't support noise here. You have ordinary omic noise, but no, this is really ballistic. And um, eventually, I mean, length independent, eventually um, you, you couple the nodes, and then you get, again cross over into omic um, behavior. So this, this kind of behavior comes out of that theory. Yeah, and, and, and at least I find it somewhat unusual. Um, OK, so that's pretty much the story I wanted uh, to tell you. Um, to wrap up, I mean, um, to a zeroth approximation, the disordered vial, we believe, is a 3D Anderson plus a bit of topology mixed in. Um, it supports a rather stable, oh, you can read here. It supports a rather stable um, uh, anomalous Hall effect and uh, layered quantum Hall physics, but then there is also the chiral magnetic effect, which sits in the Chan Simons uh, term. And um, the most interesting to me, at least, uh, conclusion of this is that the Chan Simons leads to this um, 
Diffusion Drift, physics, ballistic at large scales, diffusive at small, small scales, so uh, that I have not seen before. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>